and welcome to GameSack. You know what? Old consoles are awesome, but I don't need to tell you that. I mean, it's basically the foundation of the show. Not that I don't love the newer stuff too, but I just really like it when new games are made for these old consoles. And thanks to many independent developers, they just keep on coming. And these were released physically too and will work on original hardware. So let's check out several of these newer games for old consoles. First up is Yeah Yeah Beebus 2 on the NES from Rigged Games and Mega Cat Studios released in 2021. It's also on the Dreamcast, Switch, and Steam. In this game you play as a Chinese hopping vampire, because vampires love hopping around. They hop because they can't bend their legs due to rigor mortis, yet somehow they have enough muscle control to hop. I also love that Chinese hopping vampires always have the price tags on their hats hanging in their face. Be sure to check the comments below explaining how it's really a talisman for sealing them if you want to know more. Your goal in each stage is to kill a certain amount of evil before the timer runs out. For example, in the first stage, you have to kill 10 evil. Yes, evil is a noun in this game. The evils are usually death masks, but some of them are green dragons. There's a floating eye that moves back and forth on certain platforms, but he's not an evil that can be killed. Can only stun him for 5 seconds, but then he comes back just like a red skeleton in Castlevania. Anyone remember Castlevania? Some stages have ladders that you can jump up, but you can't climb down them. Instead, you have to fall off of an edge to get down. There are also spikes in some places that can hurt you. You have a power meter, a number of lives, as well as your countdown timer. As you kill evils, they'll sometimes leave behind certain items that can do stuff for you. Like a coin for extra points, adding 15 seconds to the clock, and an icon that freezes not only the evils, but also the countdown timer. There's also a potion for temporary invincibility and a heart that restores power. Every 10th stage you'll fight a boss. After that you start all over again with the same stages, only a different color. You can choose to play this game as one of two different characters, but they're mostly the same. This game is also two player simultaneous. Overall the controls feel good. Now you've heard of games with steep difficulty curves, right? Well this game has a very gentle difficulty curve if it even has one at all. The timer is the biggest challenge and there were very few times where it even got close to zero for me. If you know how to avoid the spikes, then your power meter shouldn't drain too much and you'll be fine. After 25 stages, I kind of got bored since there really are only 10 different stages throughout the entire game. Even the bosses are all the same and they're piss easy. I mean, look at this. I think this is a better game for the younger set who are just learning how to play games. The graphics are simple, but they work. The music is all fairly old royalty free stuff, but it sounds good on the system. The other versions of this game don't add any enhanced graphics or sounds other than some wallpaper in the backgrounds and a sound test and nicer menus. So is this better than the first Yeah Yeah Beebus game? Of course it is, this one actually exists. The first one was only ever listed in the back of game magazines where all those game store ads were. See, check it out, it's right here. It was probably a mistranslation of something, but hey, we'll never know. Anyway, this one is called Yeah Yeah Beebus 2 on the very slim chance that an actual prototype shows up someday. Now watch, a prototype shows up and it turns out to be a racing game or something. Anyway, this is a good one for your kids. It may or may not come to the Xbox and PlayStation in the future, but those platforms require achievement and trophy systems to be added. This is FLEA for the Sega Dreamcast from Low Tech Games. It was released in 2020. This is also on the NES, which is what it was developed for, Steam, Itch.io, and the Evercade. I first played it on the Evercade a short while back as it's on the Indie Heroes cartridge, but I only showed it for a few seconds and didn't talk specifically about it. Well, I'm going to now. You're Henry, the hyperactive flea. Your job is to travel inside different animals and collect blood. Fortunately, all of the blood is conveniently stored inside individual vials for you to collect. Get all of the blood and exit to the next room. You don't need to collect all of the blood to exit, but the more blood you collect, the more extra lives you'll get when you visit this guy. And you're gonna need them. You start out with 20 lives, but it's incredibly easy to die. You're always jumping. Always. You can jump less high by mashing the A button before you land, but that's pretty much the only control you're given besides steering him. Well, you can also press Y to kill yourself if you need to and start the room over. I'm not a big fan of having the characters do things that I don't have any control over. I'd prefer a less hyperactive flea. Hell, maybe you can unlock a lazy flea if you can beat the game, I'm not sure. 
I think the game would still be plenty challenging if I controlled when he jumped. Beating this game will be tough as there are over 80 levels. Every once in a while there's a boss fight, or at least that's what the game calls them. You don't actually fight anything, but instead it's an auto-scrolling screen where you need to survive and maybe collect a little blood along the way. You'll lose a lot of lives in these stages, but you'll want to keep trying again and again. The graphics are NES quality, of course. It doesn't exactly feel like you're inside of an animal or anything, but that's okay. The music is energetic and fun, also NES quality. There are no enhancements to the Dreamcast version here that are immediately obvious. However, it does come with an audio CD featuring the seven musical tracks from the game. It doesn't use the VMU to save your progress. You start from the very beginning each and every time. If I could save after each boss level or even each new world, well, I'd like that very much. Anyway, this game is marketed as having brutal difficulty. At least a difficulty curve is handled well and it lets you get used to things before it starts destroying you too much. Maybe run down to the video store and rent this one first. Oh wait, you can play a demo right in your web browser to see if it might be something you'd enjoy. Overall, I certainly don't hate it, and there's definitely some fun to be had here. I really like platforming adventure games, and fortunately for me, that's what these next two titles are all about. This is Demons of Astaborg on the Genesis from Neofid, and it came out in 2021. It's also on the Switch and all Steam platforms. That's right, even Mac and Linux. This is a hack and slash platformer that's better than your initial first impression might be. Basically, you're a dude, and your job is to defeat evil beings and stuff. If you want to know more about the story, there's a cool intro as well as text throughout the game that will reveal more and more as you go. Anyway, you start out being able to jump and slash with your sword. You can also roll and more importantly, jump off of vertical walls. You collect coins which can be used in the shop. Small rubies as well as other items can be sold for coins. And you'll need them because the stuff in the shop can be expensive and you'll only see it between levels. Speaking of the levels, they can be quite large. There's a skeleton ghost that you encounter that you need to find a memory for. Do this and you'll get a special ability, like being able to shoot a magic arrow thingamajig, or a barrier that can deflect certain items and enemy attacks. You use these by pressing the other button on the controller, you know, the ones that you're not using for jumps and attack. You can't just spam these, however, as the blue gauge on the other side of your life bar will deplete. That's fine, though, as it auto-refills when you're not using the special button. Some of the levels can be pretty clever with the usage of the special powers, like deflecting these cannonballs to blast open barriers, or steering these walking bombs to a door that you need to blast open to proceed. Sometimes you just need to make your way as fast as you can before the platforms blow up. At first, I kind of hated the level design, but it didn't take long to appreciate it. The boss fights are big events, to be sure. Again, I hated them at first, but once you learn their patterns, they can be really fun. They do take a long time, though. For example, when I was recording the footage for this review, I died many, many, many times on this boss, and I just turned it off because I didn't want to have 75 gigabytes of video footage of just me fighting him again and again. I still really enjoy fighting him, though. What's really weird is that the first boss doesn't have a life bar, but the second boss does down here. Of course, once that life bar goes away, he grows another one because F you. There are four save slots, but it only saves between levels, so it's not really recommended to power off on a boss fight like I did. Oh well. Also, this is the biggest Genesis cartridge to date, clocking in at 14.6 megabytes or over 116 mega power in Sega's marketing terms. You couldn't tell by playing it though, as nothing here seems like it eats up a bunch of memory compared to other games on the console. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't seem like a tiny game either. The graphics do their job, and are pretty nice with some great scrolling. There's also some nice rotation animation here and there. Most of the enemies, and especially the bosses, have good animation as well. The music and sound are also very good. There doesn't seem to be an overabundance of sampled sounds or anything, but what's here is quite nice and totally fits the game. I recommend that you try this one if you can. It really starts hooking you once you get a feel for everything. Just be sure to block off some time when you get to a boss fight. It's worth it though. There's also a semi-follow-up to this game that was recently kickstarted called Astabros. 
It's a roguelike thing with randomly generated dungeons. It'll be interesting to see how this one turns out, but in the meantime, be sure to try out Astaborg. This is Intrepid Izzy for the Dreamcast. It was released in 2021 and is from Senile Team and Wave. This is an adventure platformer and I must say it's pretty damn good. You released evil into the world and now you need to set it right. Run and jump through the levels using your expanding moveset to get around and defeat the enemies. You have a punch for your attack. You can even do a tiger uppercut by pressing up and attack. You also have a spirit bar that can be filled up by collecting purple diamonds or standing on a spirit fountain. This will let you do certain moves like a fireball, but of course it's going to eat up some of your meter. There will sometimes be some minor puzzles that need to be solved in order to progress. Overall, this plays like a mix of the Monster Land games, Metroid, and of course Shantae. In the town, you can talk to people and even buy food. The food can increase your attack strength temporarily, fill up your spirit meter, and restore your health. Scattered throughout each area are black mirrors. These will allow you to teleport to any other black mirror in the game that you've already discovered. You can also get new outfits throughout the game. For example, the squirrel suit allows you to glide in the air during a jump. It also allows you to float upwards using vents. Each outfit has its own magic as well, like a little tornado or a downward smash. The helmet allows Izzy to toss dynamite to blow up rocks. You'll need these outfits to get places that you couldn't before in areas you've already been to. You can't switch outfits on the fly, unfortunately, so most areas are built around one outfit or another. You can change outfits back at your house, so use the black mirrors if you need to change. Of course, there are boss fights, and the patterns are really fun to learn. The control is super smooth and accurate. My only gripe is that doing a low attack uses the same command as sliding. Some enemies can only be defeated with low attacks, and if you accidentally press attack again after they've been defeated, you could slide into an area where you'd rather not be. There aren't many different enemies, and the blue scorpions are the worst. They attack before you can hit them, and I usually try to avoid them completely if I can. Your life only has three hearts. You can get more by finding four heart fragments, but these are few and far between, sadly. In the town, there's also some mini games that you can play in order to get the high score. These are all very simple games, but somehow they're still fun. It may take some practice, but you should try to beat the high score on all three machines. The graphics are mostly nice and colorful. Everything moves smoothly, though the characters do look like a mobile game. I swear that these guys must be Kickstarter backers or something because they kind of look like bit strips versions of real people. God, I hate bit strips. There's a standard screen mode and a letterbox mode. The letterbox mode literally just chops off the top and bottom of the picture and moves your HUD down. You could zoom this in to fill your screen at the cost of some resolution if you want, though I would have preferred an anamorphic widescreen mode so at least the vertical resolution would remain intact. The music is really good and it never gets tiresome. It's generally quite upbeat. Some versions of the game come with a soundtrack CD. So, are there any negatives about this one? Well, I think the biggest one would be the overall lack of variety in everything. A lot of the areas look the same, and it can take quite some time before you see anything truly new. There also aren't a large amount of different enemies. Still, the game does a good job keeping your attention with its smooth gameplay and excellent control. I really can't recommend this one enough. <laughs> This is The Cursed Knight on the Genesis from Broke Studio. The ROM for this one showed up after I completed the rest of this episode, but I thought I could squeeze a quick segment in here. You play as an individual with some fancy armor and you'll get a few upgrades along your journey. Part of the game plays like a shooter where you can shoot in both directions. Then it becomes a platformer slash run and gun. Eventually, you'll be able to shift gravity just like Metal Storm on the NES. It's kind of funny because I'm actually including Metal Storm in the next GameStack episode I'm working on and I just got done editing that segment. There are also motorcycle sequences. You gotta be careful here because it's super easy to get hit. You seem to have unlimited lives and the game counts how many times you died after each level. The graphics here are kind of a mixed bag, but they do pull off some good effects now and then. The music is mostly pretty nice as well. 
they're doing a Kickstarter for physical copies of this one if you're interested. I may take a more in-depth look at this title in a future New Games for Old Consoles episode. Even the Neo Geo can get in on the action, but stay tuned after that as there's also a new Game Boy Color title. Xeno Crisis. Here's Xeno Crisis from Bitmap Bureau on the Neo Geo, which came out in 2021. I know, I know, how many times do I need to cover Xeno Crisis? Well, it keeps coming out on different platforms, so I need to cover it. Unless we see a PC Engine version, which would totally rule by the way, this should probably be the last time. Anyway, by now you probably know that this is an overhead shooter similar in concept to games like Smash TV. I won't get into the nitty gritty details of the game itself this time other than to say that it's really tough and also really fun. Since it was designed to control like Smash TV, it obviously controls differently here on the Neo Geo. Basically, you hold down B to fire, and you can rotate counterclockwise by tapping A and clockwise by tapping C. When you're not firing, A will let you roll and C will toss a grenade. D is your melee attack. This all works, but that means you can't toss grenades or roll while firing. However, in the Genesis, you couldn't roll while firing either. You could toss grenades though. I wasn't really digging the rotating thing, so I aim by just stopping my fire and then aiming where I want to shoot and then firing again. There's also a Neo Geo CD pad mode, but it doesn't work like a dual joystick like you'd think even though the Neo Geo CD has a diamond configuration set of buttons. This game is available on all Neo Geo platforms, the MVS, the AES, and the Neo Geo CD. I don't have a Neo Geo CD unit unfortunately, I had to borrow a unit to make that episode. In fact, many of the GameSat console episodes are like that if you didn't know. Anyway, there are some differences between the games. The AES version gives you three credits and you'll use them up quickly as you only have one life per continue. The MVS version, however, allows you to add as many credits as you want so you can plow through the game with unlimited continues. The AES version has an option screen and a sound test, the MVS version does not. Of course, you can flip back to the MVS or AES editions if you have a Unibios installed. Speaking of that, I like how when you access the Unibios, the Xeno Crisis logo is on there with specific options for the game. There are no in-game cheats accessible with the Unibios, however. What's interesting to me is that the AES version seems brighter than the MVS version, even though it shouldn't be at all. I used a Retro Tink 5X to upscale both versions with the same settings, however I used a SCART cable with the MVS and an HD RetroVision component cable and a Neo Geo adapter for the AES. No, I didn't have the brightness switch on the HD RetroVision cable set the wrong way, as you can see me testing that theory by toggling it here. My AES has an RGB bypass done by Neotropolis slash Kennyboy or something like that. It was done like over a decade ago, so it's probably just too bright anyway. So how are the Neo Geo versions different from the 2019 Genesis original? Well, aside from the control schemes, the score is now visible at the top of the screen and the credits at the bottom. You can now continue immediately without fading out into a different screen first. Oh, and there's a high score table now. Graphically, it's largely the same as the Genesis version, and it doesn't seem to sport many, if any, more colors on screen. However, there are a greater variety of characters that you rescue. There's a tiny bit of scaling that's been added, like when creatures fall from the sky into the room that you're in, or the scaling pill when you continue. Lastly, there's certainly less flicker on the boss encounters. When it comes to the sound, oh boy. First of all, there are a lot more voices in here compared to the Genesis original, and they sound significantly cleaner as you'd expect. We've discovered the airlock, which leads us to the alien nest. Let's crash their party. The percussion in the music is also a little cleaner. Other than that, the music sounds almost identical to the Genesis game, although some FM-based instruments have been substituted for similar sounding ones on the Neo Geo's different sound chip. And the Neo Geo is also louder. Oh yeah, and the music is shifted to the left for some reason in the Neo Geo versions. I'm 
not sure how this wasn't caught. This isn't the first time I've heard audio issues that could have been fixed before they released the game. I mean, remember Demolition Man on the Sega CD a couple of episodes back? The sound effects and voices are perfectly centered though, with the exception of the dialogue and the opening cinematic. Commander Darius, we have a code red distress signal from Outpost 88. You can also purchase the ROM for much cheaper and play it on the Mister. The sound problem still exists here, and in fact it's even worse as all of the music is hard panned to the left. Room clear. This is with ROM version 1.0.0, so maybe they can fix this. The Neo Geo CD version streams all of its music from the disc. I gave the audio a listen in my CD player and it doesn't suffer from this issue at all. Overall, this is still a great game, but it's not hugely above and beyond the Genesis version. This is Rush Rush Rally Reloaded on the Dreamcast from Senile Team and Wave, and it's a 2022 game. This is an overhead 2D racing title that's exclusive to the console, so no NES quality graphics or sound here. Choose from several different cars and take on the race, which you always start out in last place because F you. I love racing games, but I've never cared much for the overhead ones like this, so it's important to take that into consideration when listening to my review here. I find that this game controls slowly and it makes responding fast enough to the turns a chore, even if you know it's coming. But this has always been a bane of overhead racers. Can you imagine driving your car and not being able to see much further than 20 feet in front of you? That's what it's like playing this game. The camera is a bit too close to the action. You can also play time attacks and different challenges, but it's still not very fun because you'll be spending most of your time banging into barriers, even if you're generous with the brakes. The scrolling is just too fast because the camera is too close. Yeah, I know I'm complaining a lot, and you can clearly see that I suck at the game. Some overhead racing games do it a little better, like a couple of the old Micro Machine games. They still aren't favorites of mine, though. I'm amazed that anyone thought to make a new racing game in this particular style. I really do want to like it, though, because I love how it looks and sounds. The graphics are quite good with nice detail. I like how the cows and other things splatter when they get run over. The music is also really good. It comes with a sound test, and if you hate treble for some reason, you can reduce what they call clarity. It also includes a soundtrack CD for uncompressed audio that you can rip with a CD player that your computer doesn't have. The VMU will save your high score, and there's even a password to participate in online high scores. Still, I'm not able to overcome my disdain for this particular subgenre. If you like racing games like this, then you'll likely enjoy it much more than I did. Senile Team did such a tremendous job on Intrepid Izzy, but I don't think much can be done to make games like this enjoyable for me. I still love you guys, though. Finally, this is Space EX for the Game Boy Color from TG Virtual and it was released at the very end of 2021. This one is an RPG. Wait, no. It's a platformer. No, it's a shooter. Actually, it's all three, and yet none of them at the same time. You take control of Elon. No, not Elon Musk. I mean, I don't know, maybe? Hmm, Space EX. Space X? Elon? The Origin Regime? Wait a minute, this game is based on a true story! At first, you need to get a level 2 access card in order to access the Space EX facility to deliver neural links to a bunch of different planets. Each planet is basically a stage, and each stage requires different things of you. Sometimes you'll be platforming, but all you need to worry about is jumping. The controls here are a bit slippery, but they don't take long to get used to. Once you get into your rocket ship, you'll deliver some neural links to the hooded lady of the region and then make your way to the next planet. Sometimes you'll partake in a horizontal shooter segment, but you only need to worry about shooting and moving up and down. On the next planet, you'll need to make your way to a different rocket ship, I assume, so you can go to another planet. It's all just a typical day in the real life of Elon Musk, or at least in his own head. If you pause the game and then press right, you can see a list of the tasks that you need to accomplish on that planet. There are even some kicker slider puzzles to solve here. 
There are save points all over the place, so if you fail at something, you usually won't be set back too terribly far. Overall, the game is pretty easy, but it does have some slightly challenging segments, mainly due to the collision detection of these things. I'm not going to complain about it though, because at least it adds some challenge. Graphically is pretty sparse, even for a Game Boy Color game, but I guess at least the scrolling is smooth. The music is pretty good though, and you can even get the soundtrack on cassette if you buy the $84 physical bundle. The cassette is an interesting audio and data hybrid. There are cheaper physical bundles that don't include the tape. Otherwise, you can pay 15 bucks for a downloadable ROM and play it on an emulator or a flash cart like I'm doing here with the Game Boy Player on my GameCube. This game won't offer up the most challenge in the world, but I think it would be good for younger players. Even though I found it easy for the most part, I was always interested in seeing what the next planet wanted me to do. There you go, those were seven new games that work on the old hardware. And I keep wondering throughout all this, where are all the new Super Nintendo games? There seem to be very, very few of those. Anyway, what did you think of these games? And are there any upcoming games that work on old consoles that you're looking forward to? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Are you looking for the hottest new video game to play? No. The latest in gaming excellence, challenge, and immersion? No, oh, really, I'm just chilling right now. Then you need to play Folklore on the PlayStation 3. That's not exactly the hottest new game, but seriously, I'm fine. Do you want to check out the hottest new movie? I do not. Then you need to check out Rambo 3 on 4K Blu-ray CD. It's not even the best Rambo movie. Why would I want to watch that instead of diddling around on my phone here? It's Rambo 3. Yeah, no thanks. Do you want to drink the hottest new cola on the market? Oh, Christ. Then you need to drink Diet Coke right away. Diet Coke's been around since 1982. Do you want to use the softest new tissues known to man? Then you need to blow your nose with Puffs Ultra Soft right now. Why me? Do you want to clean those nasty, dirty deposits on your VCR heads? No. Then use Scotch High Performance VCR Head Cleaner for the best picture available. Please just go away. Do you eat food? Well, yeah, actually, sometimes I do. Then eat Kraft Mexican-style shredded cheese. Mmm, perfect! Kraft Mexican-style shredded cheese. It's nature's perfect food.